Welcome everybody to uh, this, our first Rare Book School formal summer lecture. Normally, I would be welcoming you after a day of classes uh, for 90 minute sessions for a total of 30 hours during the week of hands-on instruction at Rare Book School. Normally, you wouldn't be sitting at home having a beer perhaps uh, or an iced tea normally you would be in an auditorium in a much more formal setting and you would be tired but you would also be excited because you had the opportunity to study with some of the best faculty and you would have been working hand it's been a tremendous disappointment to the rare book school faculty and to the staff as well that we haven't been able to welcome you in person this summer about our classes. This would have been a record year for us, but COVID-19 intervened. And of course, the health and safety of our students and faculty and staff is paramount. But we are already working on programming for next year and we expect to be fully operational next summer, public health officials permitting. Uh, meanwhile, I would urge you to continue to consult RBS online. Uh, we're gonna have about 60 different programs this summer, and I expect some programming right through the fall. Uh, there are some 350 of you uh, on the Zoom tonight, which is really great. So many of you have been availing yourself of our digital. I very much hope you will continue to do so. Before introducing our lecturer, let me say as the director of Rare Book School, I'm deeply indebted to the staff and particular to Laura Parings and Laura Item, who have had charge of the programming and execution principally for RBS Online. They have done tremendous work, as have the rest of the staff, and they deserve our hearty congratulations. How fitting that a metadata librarian should give her big rare book school lecture virtually. Brenna Baikowski was graduated summa cum laude from Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland, before attending Indiana University Bloomington, where she earned an MS tree and an MLS in library science from what is arguably the best program in the country. She is currently a catalog and metadata librarian at the Beinecke Library of Yale University, where she creates records for a range of materials from incunabula to comic books. Brenna was previously a cataloger for the North American Imprints Program at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. Brenna also works on special metadata and cataloging projects, such as the Black Bibliography Project and the LD4P, that is to say, Linked Data for Production. She is active in RBMS, serving, for example, as the co-chair of the Controlled Vocabularies Editorial Group. So watch what you say. That's not really what controlled vocabularies means at all, as many of you know. Really, she's a rising star. Brenna is with us this evening because I heard her give an outstanding lecture from lists to links, new directions in black bibliography in November of 2019. And I knew we had to have her at Rare Book School to share her insights with us. Her lecture tonight, Superheroes and Shing Affairs, or Adventure Cataloging Popular Literature, promises to be both fun and informative. I am delighted to have Brenna in our midst, even if by virtual means. Please join 
join in welcoming her. Brenna. Thank you, Michael. Welcome everyone. And thank you again, Michael, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to the entire staff of our book school for inviting me and hosting me to speak tonight. I'm sorry that I cannot be in Charlottesville in person, but I am delighted to be with you all virtually. Before I properly begin, I want to say that I conceptualized this lecture um, before the country shut down because of the pandemic and wrote most of it before the massive wave of Black Lives Matter protests in the past weeks. It feels surreal to be talking about dime novels and comic books when there are so many substantive and serious conversations happening throughout the country about systemic racism. Librarianship, special collections, and cataloging are not free from these damaging legacies. Libraries are not neutral. Catalogers specifically are actively grappling with the biases inherent in the tools and vocabularies we use to provide description and access to our collections, especially those collections that have been historically un or under described. Cataloging is not neutral. What I will be speaking about is one small corner of that broader conversation. If anyone is interested in learning more about that work, some introductory resources are on the screen. I am a rare book cataloger. It is my job and the job of all catalogers to create descriptions that connect our library's users to our materials. If we have done our jobs well, patrons can find the things they came to the library looking for. If we have done our jobs really well, they find things they didn't know they were looking for. In special collections, our stacks are closed and cannot be browsed. The catalog is a prime avenue for patrons to engage with the collections. Library collections that are not described are essentially invisible. The catalog records we create stand in for the books, journals, broadsides, maps, and all other materials in the collection. This is especially important when someone is searching the catalog from outside the library building. This work may seem relatively straightforward, a simple task of transferring information from an item into a computer, but it requires intellectual engagement with the materials to appropriately and accurately describe and represent them. Cataloging is a work of mediation, translating and distilling a physical or digital object into useful metadata. Determining what constitutes appropriate and accurate description and access for any given material is subjective and contextual. It changes over time and it varies from library to library. For example, the American Antiquarian Society or AAS, where I began my professional cataloging career, handles its handful of incunabula, which are early European books printed with movable type, much differently than the Beinecke Library handles ours. Incunabula fall far outside the scope of AAS's collection, so they have not received the detailed description the same materials receive at the Beinecke, where they form a substantial and important part of the library's collections. In an ideal bibliographic world, catalogers give all library materials a description that best suits the needs of the holding institution and its patrons. We do not live in an ideal world, and the context in which catalogers work is constantly shifting. Collection priorities change, trends in academic scholarship change, technology changes, cataloging standards change, society changes. While all of these can be challenging to navigate, they also present an opportunity to reimagine the work that we do, allowing us to more effectively achieve our goal of uniting patrons with our collections. Library cataloging has changed dramatically in my lifetime. As an elementary school student in the 90s, I was taught to navigate a physical card catalog in the school library. Now, as a practicing librarian in 2020, I have actively worked in experimental linked open data cataloging projects. 
these two worlds of cataloging are separated by time, technology, and practice. But the ghost of cataloging past haunts our catalogs and our descriptive practices today. This evening, I'm going to discuss my experiences cataloging two different types of popular literature, dime novels and comic books. I knew next to nothing about dime novels when I started working with them as a novice cataloger, and I ended up receiving a crash course in the messy history of cheap, popular publishing that developed in the latter half of the 19th century. I came to comic books with many more years of cataloging experience and a knowledge of the medium born from reading them recreationally, and as a result, felt much better equipped to catalog them. But in both cases, I discovered that these materials and the ways patrons want to find them fit uneasily into the descriptive universe of library cataloging. Some of the difficulties in cataloging these materials, such as the relative scarcity of scholarly reference sources, can best be alleviated by increased research and writing about them, which is outside my control. But I have been given the latitude and flexibility within my own work, both to adjust my own cataloging practice to better meet the needs of these materials and to learn about the potential avenues for description that emerging technologies might provide. From this experience, I propose two primary methods of addressing the challenges raised by dime novels and comic books. The first is to re-examine how catalogers handle subject analysis of fiction and how we identify the writers and artists who contribute to periodicals. The second is to leverage the power of linked data in the internet to bring our descriptive data together with the data being created and compiled by fans. I believe that both of these approaches in concert with each other have the potential to dramatically improve our ability to make these materials available to our patrons. So to begin with, what are dime novels and comic books? Dime novels are a variety of melodramatic fiction that was created in 1860 and was popular in the United States through the early 1900s. Published as cheap pamphlets, most cost five or 10 cents, bound in flimsy paper covers we call wrappers, they were generally regarded as low quality fiction. The first dime novel was Malayaska, The Indian Wife of the White Hunter, written by Mrs. Ann S. Stevens and published by Irwin P. Beadle and Company as number one of Beadle's dime novels. The earliest dime novels published by Beadle were deeply nationalistic and featured stories of the American Revolution and westward expansion. The sensational literature commonly associated with the term developed subsequently. More of us are familiar with comic books than dime novels, but as there is some variation in how terminology is used, I will offer my working definitions. Comic books are magazines published anywhere from monthly to annually that offer serialized storytelling using a combination of sequential art and text. They are distinct from graphic novels, which use the same medium of art and text, but are books featuring contained stories rather than magazines that present ongoing narratives. Because comic books are what librarians would call serials or periodicals, they present more specific cataloging challenges than graphic novels do as individual books. So while some of what I will describe applies equally to graphic novels, I will be focusing specifically on comic books in my discussion. Early in my tenure as a cataloger at AAS, my boss asked me if I would be willing to take on the project of cataloging the society's collection of dime novels. While there had been multiple discussions before I was hired about properly cataloging the collection, there had not previously been the staff or time to devote to such a project. My boss made it quite clear that the dime novels were complicated. While this was the first time a supervisor handed me a book or project and said, this is going to be a mess, how fun. It was absolutely not going to be the last. As a quick tangent, I will say that in my experience, 
these challenges are one of the best parts of being a special collections cataloger. Not only do these projects tend to require research, which is always a delightful use of my history training, but they push the limits of my experience and knowledge, forcing me to be creative and flexible, and I always learn something new. Yes, they are usually frustrating, and when beginning one, I inevitably think to myself, it'll be an adventure, Charlie. For those of you unfamiliar with the reference, I direct you to the surprisingly detailed Wikipedia page for Charlie the Unicorn. Spoiler alert, his adventure ends badly. But anyway, the satisfaction is in untangling the snarl, bringing some increased order to one little corner of the bibliographic universe, and the knowledge that I have made things a little easier for the catalogers and researchers who come after me. Prior to my work on the dime novels, the collection was described on cards in the original catalog and online records derived from those cards. Catalog cards had limited space and cataloging standards used for them were designed to abridge and truncate information as much as possible. Materials perceived as being of little importance, either because of the scope of a library's collection or prevailing trends in scholarship, would receive the minimum description considered necessary for access. On the screen, you can see the catalog card for part of the dime novel collection at AAS. It lists the main publishers represented, gives the number of volumes, and points patrons to Albert Johansson's bibliography, The House of Beetle and Adams. More on that work later. But what doesn't this card tell you? There's no indication that each volume contains five or six dime novels with their wrappers removed and bound together by the collector who owns them. There's no list of titles or authors or series. Part of the tentative date range is obscured by the hole in the card, and that list of publishers is far from comprehensive. Imagine that a patron sees that card and wants to know if one of these volumes has The Maid of the Mountain by W.J. Hamilton, which was published by Beetle and Adams, or if any of them have stories by Louisa May Alcott, who wrote occasionally for Elliot Thomas and Talbot. Either the librarian or the patron is in for a long search through all 70 volumes. They would eventually find The Maid of the Mountain in volume 56, but they wouldn't have any luck with Alcott. Either of these questions can now be answered in minutes using the AAS online catalog. The record for The Maid of the Mountain not only tells you that it is bound in volume 56, but it also tells you that it was published as number 147 of Beatles Dime novels, with 24 pages of a serialized novel at the end, which are absent in the AAS copy. While Alcott's writings aren't present in the bound volumes described on the card, a story by her does appear in number 49 of Elliot Thomas and Talbot's 10 cent novelettes, which AAS holds as a pamphlet in original wrappers. And the catalog can tell you that too, but this is only possible because of the work I did to catalog the collection, which for many novels in the collection was happening decades after they had been acquired. So what is it about dime novels that makes them so difficult to catalog that doing so was put off for so long? To start with, dime novels are in many ways, ephemera disguised as books. They were meant to be cheap and disposable. As a result, the printing and publishing were quick and dirty. Dime novels were generally issued with only a copyright date, if any date at all, with changes in the publishing information and wrapper content, the only distinguishing features among different issues of the same work. Additionally, much of the useful bibliographic information, such as series name and numbering, in addition to updated publication statements, only appeared on the wrappers, which were often destroyed by use or removed by owners. Here we can see two different copies of the Midnight Lamp held by AAS. The one on the left is the copy that appears in one of the bound volumes without wrappers. The copy on the right still has its original wrappers, which are in bad condition. 
much information, including that it is number three of Hilton's 10 cent novel, 10 cent books, and that it was sold by W.D. Banker in New York, only appear on the wrapper. Without it, the information is all but inaccessible. The research required to reconstruct that data and untangle the printing history of dime novels can be substantial. But dime novels are still books, right? And if there's one thing that catalogers have perfected over the past decades, it is how to describe books. Resource Description and Access, or RDA, and its predecessor, Anglo-American Cataloging Rules Second Edition, or AACR2, cover modern books, while Descriptive Cataloging of Rare Materials, Books, or BCR and B, covers early books. Though each of these standards can, in theory, be used to describe any book that comes across a cataloger's desk, DCR and B's strength is hand press books, while AACR2 and RDA work best for 20th and 21st century materials. This leaves something of a descriptive gray area for early machine press books in the second half of the 19th century. And that is where dime novels land. Anytime there is a massive technological shift, there is a before period and an after period, but there's also a muddy transition. In the way that Incunabula carried features of manuscript culture into print, giving them characteristics different from later hand printed books, early machine press books shared characteristics with hand press books that would eventually vanish or become hidden in modern books as the process became increasingly industrialized. Dime novels are far from the only special collections material that would benefit from improved guidance and best practices for cataloging early machine press publications. Secondly, dime novels are fiction. This in of itself is not a problem. We catalog fiction all the time. However, as I learned from researchers at AAS, one major way that contemporary scholars are working with popular literature is to learn how it addressed or depicted their given area of historical interest. This means that they want to know what the novels are about. In library catalogs, subject access is given to materials through the use of subject headings. These are standardized words and phrases used to represent the same topic, person, place, etc. By using standardized terminology, we can bring works on the same topic together, even if the language used within the works themselves varies. Catalogers do not traditionally do in-depth subject access of fiction. In card catalogs, every additional subject heading assigned to a book was a physical card or set of cards that required time to file and took up physical space in a catalog drawer. This encouraged catalogers to limit their use of headings to the most prevalent two or three subjects of any given book. This is no longer a concern in online catalogs where filing time and physical space are not constraints. But determining what a work of fiction is about can be time consuming and complicated and has not been a priority in the profession. When I began cataloging the dime novels, I made the argument that it would be worthwhile to spend the extra time to provide increased subject access to them. And this decision was validated about halfway through the project. When new fellows arrive at AAS to do research, they give a brief presentation to the staff on their topic so that staff can help point them to useful materials in the collection. One fellow was doing research on loyalists during the American Revolution, and she was specifically interested in how they were depicted in 19th century literature. As she described her preliminary searches in the catalog, she began listing the titles of relevant novels she had found. I quickly recognized that most, if not all, of the books she was naming were dime novels that I had cataloged. By the nature of our work, catalogers 
seldom interact with our library's patrons. So we do not often get to hear how well our cataloging does or does not serve their needs. So that moment of hearing that the work I had done had led this researcher directly to materials useful for her work, materials that had been inaccessible before I cataloged them, was tremendously rewarding. As with my novels, the standards librarians traditionally use to catalog comic books do not adequately meet the needs of the patrons interested in these materials. If you have ever looked for a magazine or journal in a library catalog, you have seen that libraries do not catalog periodicals issue by issue. We catalog them as a whole title. So a single record will describe all issues, for example, of Time Magazine or the Chicago Defender newspaper. The same goes for comic books. As a result, periodicals present cataloging challenges that books do not. Bibliographic information that is generally stable for a single book, title, publication information, dates, can and usually does change over time in a periodical. Ideally, the catalog record will account for as many of these changes as can be reconstructed. However, as often as not, a cataloger does not have access to the whole run of a title, which means they are almost inevitably working from incomplete information. Additionally, because the record describes an entire run, certain information in the record may only be applicable to issues that the library does not hold, which can be confusing for both patrons and catalogers. The two main concerns that affect comics, however, are identifying writers and artists and providing access to individual issues. Periodicals usually contain intellectual content from many creators, both within a single issue and across the run of a title. This makes accounting for all of the contributors to a periodical in a single record impractical, if not completely impossible. Thus, writers and artists are traditionally ignored in periodical cataloging. Patrons looking at comic book collections, however, whether for pleasure reading or research, are increasingly interested in the writers and artists responsible for creating them. In some cases, such as short-lived titles or a limited run miniseries, it can be relatively straightforward to include all the writers and artists in a description. But longer series get more complicated. Let's look at Sandman as an example. It was published from January 1989 to March 1996 by DC and later its imprint Vertigo. Unusually for a title with such a long run, it had a single writer, Neil Gaiman. Additionally, Todd Klein lettered almost every issue. The half a dozen colorists start to get excessive for a single record, but are reasonably manageable. But approximately 30 different people drew the comic over its 75 issues. Not only would it be unwieldy, to squeeze all of them onto one catalog record. Including the names of that many artists is most valuable if you can associate each person with the issues they worked on. If providing access to writers and artists is a daunting task with a comic book that lasted seven years, imagine the impossibility of comprehensively identifying writers and artists with something like Detective Comics an anthology series that ran for over 70 years. Providing the names of writers and artists who contributed to a substantial group of issues is much better than recording no creators at all, and catalogers should make the effort to do so wherever possible. However, in these circumstances, we cannot record every person who worked on every issue. That kind of description is not going to happen in a library catalog unless every issue is cataloged individually. When it comes to comic books, fans have done what the librarians have not, creating rich resources filled with issue level descriptions of comic books, most com comprehensive of which is the brand comics database. 
The database provides publication information for full series and indexes them by issue, providing creators, characters, contents lists, and cover scans whenever possible. It is a level of detail and granularity that will never be replicated in a library catalog. Additionally, the data entry and description are being done by people who frequently know more about these materials than catalogers do. The data exists and continues to be expanded upon and improved. Our goal as librarians is to figure out how to use it to help our patrons and describe our collections. Special collections catalogers have a long tradition of turning to existing research to supplement and enhance our descriptions. If someone else has done the work and answered the questions, we are more than happy to put that information to good use. Most cataloging departments have their own reference libraries. We have a dedicated field in our records for citing references, and the community even maintains a database of standardized citation forms to use in catalog records. These references, however, are not collaborative databases of fan metadata. They are what librarians and scholars call bibliographies. Traditional bibliographies are scholarly works, often appearing as physical print volumes that present descriptions of some class or category of books. They can be short title lists, such as Charles Evans's 14 volume American bibliography, or works of in-depth descriptive bibliography, like the Bibliography of American Literature. These works are underpinned by years or decades of research, and their reputation of rigor and authority is an essential component of their use in bibliographic description. Catalogers can often supply information for their records, such as dates, publishers, or authors that is not obvious from the copy sitting on their desk. They can also learn about variations across the copies that can help them identify and describe their material relative to similar materials also held by their institution or by other libraries. This system of reference only works if previous scholars have spent the time researching the material that you are cataloging. If a library is collecting in a traditionally understudied area, that scholarly basis and the resulting reference works often does not exist. The creation of traditional bibliographies is time consuming and requires access to enormous library resources. And it has fallen out of popularity as an avenue of scholarly production. This leaves many burgeoning areas of study including those that focus on popular literature without these rich descriptions. The single existing traditional bibliography for dime novels highlights this gap. Albert Johansson's The House of Beetle and Adams and its Dime and Nickel Novels is an in-depth exploration of the history of the publishing houses owned by brothers Erwin P. and Erasmus Beetle and their rotation of partners including Robert, William, and David Adams. It gives an overview of the development of the dime novel as a publishing phenomenon, as well as comprehensive lists of every series published by the Beatle firms. When I was cataloging AAS's dime novels, the wealth of information in Johansson's work made cataloging Beatle materials and untangling their publication history relatively straightforward. It also made it that much more frustrating when I would catalog novels from other publishers for whom no such comprehensive work exists. Johansson's seminal work, however, was born from his personal enthusiasm for collecting dime novels. He was not a literary scholar or a historian of popular culture. By profession, his area of study was petrology which is the branch of geology that studies how rocks are formed. When it came to dime novels, he was, as I once described it to a friend, a nerd nerding it up. He did not write his bibliography as the culminating work of a career studying literature. He wrote it because he had the resources and the passion to do so, and no one else had done it yet. But 
the house of Beadle and Adams looks and feels like a traditional bibliography and librarians treat it as such. The comic book fan metadata I mentioned before, like Hanson's bibliography, is created by the people who consume the media being described rather than by scholars or academics. It does not, however, come packaged in the recognizable guise of bibliography. Thus, it has been perceived as less trustworthy than information found in traditional bibliographies because it does not come from the same grounding in scholarly tradition and because anyone can contribute to it. I believe that this distinction is artificial and a detriment to effective library description, which is a disservice to our materials and our patrons. One way to leverage this fan data is to reference it in our catalogs the same way we do other bibliographies. While making a formal citation to the Grand Comics database might require a little massaging of our practices, it is something we can do now within our existing systems and frameworks. As we begin to experiment with new cataloging systems, however, other richer avenues of using this data are possible. The utilization of fan metadata is an area where the much lauded promises of linked open data could come into play. As the name implies, linked open data allows information from different systems to be linked together <clears throat> by structuring it in a standardized format called a triple. This enables computers to connect and interpret data in more meaningful ways than previous methods of coding data allowed. It also means that data does not need to be recorded in multiple places. Unique identifiers can stand in for information recorded in a different system or database. This enables searching that brings together information from multiple places. Imagine a search interface that looks at library catalogs and a comic book database simultaneously. A patron could look for all series and issues that feature a specific character, such as Black Panther. They might find out that Black Panther was introduced in issue 52 of Fantastic Four and be pointed to the copy of this issue held by the Beinecke Library. The same kind of search could be run for writers or artists or even specific topics, combining the granular issue descriptions fans create with libraries, holdings, and catalogs. The process of designing systems that can bring our data together would ideally start a dialogue between librarians and the comic book community with the potential for sharing knowledge and expertise. Getting direct feedback from an expert community helps catalogers hone and adjust how we catalog to better meet the needs of our patrons. In return, catalogers can share our experiences with for example, controlled vocabularies or identity management to help strengthen and standardize their data. Fan metadata is also useful in dime novel cataloging, but in that arena, librarians have taken the lead in making this data available. The Dime Novel Bibliography Project, according to their website, aims to create a comprehensive online database of dime novels, story papers, reprint libraries, and related materials. The main sources for its data are lists that were compiled by Edwards T. LeBlanc. Like Albert Johansson, LeBlanc was an avid and dedicated collector of dime novels. And for over four decades, he was the editor of Dime Novel Roundup, a magazine dedicated to the study and collecting of dime novels and story papers. He kept binders of lists of the contents of every dime novel series he knew of. The bibliography is making those lists available as a searchable database. It is a truly monumental undertaking that provides an unparalleled reference source for the study of dime novels. Because the project is hosted and coordinated by Falvey Memorial Library at Villanova University, it is easy to imagine a linked data future that brings together the bibliography's data with library catalogs.
Before I wrap up, I want to make a final point about my work cataloging dime novels and comic books. In both instances, I was immeasurably aided by catalogers at other institutions. Early in my work with the dime novels, I came across Northern Illinois University's beautiful digital dime novel library, Nickels and Dimes, which allowed me to see other copies of dime novels I was cataloging. I reached out to Lynn Thomas, who at the time was NIU's curator of rare books and special collections, and who I'd met through fellow catalogers, to tell her how valuable I found it as a resource. She put me in touch with NIU cataloger, Matthew Short, which kicked off an incredibly fruitful correspondence. Matthew also introduced me to his Villanova colleague, Demian Katz, and the dime novel bibliography, all of which dramatically improved my ability to effectively catalog dime novels. When I began cataloging comic books at the Beinecke, the first thing I did was reach out to Liz Adams at Duke, who I had heard speak about comics cataloging at a conference several years before. She shared with me the practices she and her coworkers had developed for cataloging their comics. I was able to combine the information she gave me with my own knowledge of comic books to improve comics cataloging at the Beinecke, practices which I was eventually able to document and add to our cataloging manual. It has always been my professional and personal experience that special collections catalogers are extraordinarily generous with their expertise. However, when this knowledge sharing is based on professional networks built by having the time and resources to fly around the country and attend conferences, it puts catalogers without those resources at an extreme disadvantage. The more broadly and freely that we can share our expertise, the more open dialogues that we can have as a profession, and the more we can create and share documentation and standards, the better it is for all of us. The proposals I have made this evening are a mixture of concrete and aspirational. The changes to our existing practices can be made now within the context of our current cataloging tools and standards. This work requires a commitment to making these changes and a willingness to share best practices as they are developed. This is already happening, both informally and on a broader scale, including the work of ALA's Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable. Linked data cataloging, however, is still in its infancy. We have been talking about our linked data future for so long that it sometimes feels like it will never happen. While this means any developments in that area remain on the horizon, we need to start planning for them now. Software designers will never design cataloging tools that can bring all of this data together unless we ask them to, unless we make it an essential component of our expectations. Beyond these suggestions, I hope I have inspired the librarians in the audience to think critically about cataloging at their institutions. Have you developed local practices for hard to describe materials that are worth sharing with the broader community? Are there areas where you can turn to non-traditional references to provide better descriptions of your collections? For the non-librarians in the audience, I hope you have learned a little something about cataloging. The work we do is usually invisible, but it is an essential component of the library ecosystem. So the next time you do a search in a library catalog, and find exactly what you were looking for, or better yet, find something you did not even know existed, say thank you to the catalogers. Also, if I've inspired any of you to go read some comic books, well, I wouldn't complain about that either. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brenna. Um, this is Ruth Ellen St. Ong speaking on behalf of Earth Book School. And uh, Felipe Monjo and I will be moderating the Q&A session. So again, thank you, Brenna, for just your wonderful talk and the work that you're doing. The first question that I have for you is from uh, William Bryson. And he says hello to you. And he says, he's asking, I am looking for bibliographical sources that provide information on texts of popular fiction that have been transferred across the Atlantic. He notes that much of this material is poorly served by major sources since they are often not first printing. 
Um, and in his question, he also thanked you for the cataloging work that you did at the AAS, um, which he said was very helpful uh, when he was doing his work, his research there. Um, so I think Bill is specifically interested in things like British piracies of American works. I will have to confess that that is an area that is not my particular expertise. I mostly was just looking at the, the American side, not the traveling over the Atlantic side. Um, but I will do some poking around and see if I can find anything on the, the subject to, to try to, to pass along. Okay, great. I'm going to pass it over to Felipe, who's going to ask the next question. Uh, yes. Hello. I have another question here from, well, first of all, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I second Ruth's opinion that it was um, wonderful and informative. Thank you. And I have another question here from Alice Haynes, which has received uh, support from Rebecca Henning. They are wondering what some of your favorite mark tags for catalog and comic books are at the item level, if you have them. No stress. Ooh, um, well, we unfortunately don't really do comic book cataloging at the item level at the moment because that is not really the way library catalogs are built. Um, so I don't really have good mark to, to give for that. Um, but what I will say is that I do occasionally be a little flexible with the 500 notes um, if there is some sort of item level information I think is particularly worth bringing out, such as the introduction of an important character in a series, or if there is a major writer who only contributed to a small part of, of an issue. Um, I'll, I'll take advantage of the notes to be able to, to bring that information out. Okay, so we have, I just I meant to say this at the beginning, but we're, we're going to do our best to um, address everyone's questions, but I have a feeling that we won't be able to get to all of them. But there have been several people who um, talked about the importance of the GCD, as Brenna pointed out, um, and how it's, it's a nonprofit that could benefit from financial support from donors. Uh, Mike Rode pointed that out. And uh, the question is that I'm reading is from Peter John Burns. Uh, asking, on a scale from mild disquiet to abject terror, how much concern is there regarding the relative permanence of online databases like the GCD? It seems about as permanent as an online resource gets, but research libraries appropriately think in decades, if not centuries. Oh, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say abject terror, but um, there is definitely concern one of uh, the comic book databases that I personally very much enjoyed using um, took itself offline at the end of last year. And I was very disappointed to see that because it had some different ways of handling the information that it recorded than the Grand Comics database did. And um, GCD even responded to the, the sort of falling apart of that site and made some changes to accommodate people bringing data over into theirs. Um, so it is, it is definitely a concern, but um, while the information is there, it's useful. And I think we should take advantage of it if we can. Great, thank you. Okay, I have the next question from Bob Kosofsky. Uh, he says, thank you, and fully agrees with your belief in the obligation to create slash enhance bibliographic records with rich information. And he's wondering if you can discuss how to balance the need of detailed bibliographic information with administrators who are willing to look only at the numbers of materials cataloged. Hmm, well, I will say generally, I'm lucky that I'm not the one having those conversations with administrators. I usually just have them with my bosses who then take it, take it up a level. Um, but I, I think it's an area where educating our administrators on what a catalog does and 
um, how it better brings our, our patrons in contact with our collections is very important. Um, because we work in back rooms, a lot of people don't really understand what goes into cataloging. And so education on the subject is very important. Um, but it's also, I think, important to remind our administrators that anything that we, we don't describe can't be seen. And we, if something's worth having, it is worth describing well enough for patrons to be able to find it. Thank you. I really agree with that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question is from Megan Constantinou, and she asks if you could talk more specifically about some of the ways you have incorporated fan generated metadata into your catalog records. And she wants to know if you are developing customized taxonomies. Ooh, um, so the, the main thing that I have done so far, because unfortunately, linked data does not properly exist as a, as a cataloging avenue yet, um, is for a way to sort of survey the creators of the series that I'm cataloging. Uh, usually, I only have a small portion of the entire run of whatever it is I'm looking at. And going through the fan metadata is a good way to get a snapshot of the, the major contributors so that I can better include that information. Um, because as I mentioned, while it's, it's not as good as being able to, to identify everybody, at least being able to identify the top contributors, shall we say, is, is important. Um, and the fact that people do have all that information together in you know a way that I that I can look through is the primary thing that that I have done um, that's also very good for some of the early uh, the comics which in the comics themselves aren't very good at identifying who wrote and drew them and comic book fans have done the research and read the books to help figure some of that out and so they have put the information out there and then I can take advantage of that Great, thanks so much. Um, I have another question from Just Michael, who says hello and asks, given that titles and series names of comics sometimes vary at times throughout a comics run, do you have any advice or insight regarding the use of 490 or 830 fields in the mark record with regard to the title on an item versus the standardized series name? Thank you. So in serials cataloging, we don't use the 490 and 830 as much. Um, so when it comes to, to comics, and especially having a different title on the cover than you'll find in the Indicia, cover titles vary a lot, even if the Indicia title stayed relatively stable. Um, the 246 is the field I would usually use to record the the other titles and it does give you the ability to say give a date range for when that title was applied or used in any given series so that's the, the primary way that i i would handle those other titles okay so our next question is less about um specifics of cataloging but more about different types of books and jeff barton was asking if you could talk a bit about similarities and differences between dime novels and comics and toy books which um the aas has several or many examples of so what they all sort of have in common is that they are not high literature. Um, they are all, you know, meant to be used and appreciated and not necessarily last that long. I mean, toy books are mostly for, for children. And if there's one thing most of us know from our own experiences as children with books or from the children in our lives, children are very rough on the books that they own even if they're made very well. And dime novels and comic books, especially early comics, were um, 
you know, published so cheaply that they didn't stand up to, to very good wear at all. And so they all sort of have the challenge of not being in really great shape necessarily when it comes for us to catalog them and working with incomplete materials just sort of ratchets up how difficult it can be to, to catalog these things. All right, thank you. Um, I have another slightly less cataloging related uh, question from Alice Haynes, who's wondering if there are any references you could recommend for identifying the artists involved in uh, the creation of comics or dime novels. So, um, Honestly, for comics, I would say one of the most comprehensive things you can look at right now is the, the Grand Comics database, because um, it's a pretty good aggregation of the, the available research that is out there. Um, there are a variety of decent books that are on you know, the history of a particular a comic publisher or anything like that that can have good information about their early days and the the artists who were involved. Um, they tend to focus on the more famous artists and so the people who actually drew the comics not necessarily quite as much on excuse me the colorists or you know that level but um, I can't think of any specific ones off the top of my head, but like I said, mostly that information, the, the fans are doing a good job of, of aggregating into the, the GCD. Dime novels are more complicated. Um, if like the, the art is, has not traditionally been the part people have talked about a lot. There's been some research on the authorship because pseudonyms abound, but, um, most dime novels only had a color cover illustration or a frontispiece. And most of the Beatle ones were signed and were done by Nathaniel Orr in uh, New York, but with the, the other publishers, not quite as much. And unfortunately, I have not encountered any really good sources for that information. Okay, well, it's eight o'clock now, so we're going to wrap up the Q&A, and we do apologize to those people who asked questions and we didn't have a chance to address them. Um, Brenna, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, we're just really happy to be able to learn more about the work you're doing and about these materials. And I'd also like to thank everyone who has taken part tonight, and I know that in the chat, uh, everyone is saying thank you as well to Brenna and many of the people who's questions you answered, they express their gratitude. So uh, I hope you have a lovely evening and uh, best wishes to all of you and thank you for Rare Book School. We'll, we'll be posting the recording of this video on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Have a nice evening. <laughs>